on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. we come to the part of our service where we reflect on God's law, on how we fall short of the standards that God has given to us. And today, we're going to read about how Israel fell short of the standards that God set for them. And really, when we think about Israel, what we should see is Israel's failure to earn the right to stay in their land is similar to our failure to be able to enter heaven. And so think about that as we read God's law this morning from Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 19. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, the increase of your herds and the young of your flocks. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. Lord, let's pray. Our Father, when we read these words, we realize that we, we can't obey your voice. We can't do all of your commandments. We haven't done all of your commandments this morning, let alone our entire lives. And so, Lord, we pray that you would have mercy on us, that you would forgive us, for the myriads of ways in which we don't deserve your grace and we don't deserve your blessing. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we confess our sin together. We confess, Almighty God, that we have greatly sinned in our thoughts and in our words, in what we have done and in what we have failed to do. We call upon you to remember your promise to us. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. If we were left on our own to earn our salvation by being obedient to the law, we would be without hope. That's what so many people miss. When the, t when the law speaks, there's no wiggle room in the law. It's not a sliding scale. It's not if I'm 51% good and 49% bad, I'm good enough. The law demands absolute 
perfect obedience every day of our lives. Uh, and if we were on our own, we would be without hope. But God solved that problem for us by sending his son Jesus in the flesh uh, to be our champion, to fulfill all the requirements of the law for us and then to die to take the penalty of our sin. And that is what the good news is. So let's listen now uh, to the gospel reading. This is from Revelation chapter 7, 13 through 17. And then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? And I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb is in the midst of the throne and will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And that's the good news. That's the gospel. Jesus is sheltering us with his presence, with his righteousness, uh, with his intercession for us. And we are safe and we are resting in him and his work for us. And so it is my great joy as God's minister to you in Christ to assure you uh, that if you are resting in Jesus, if you are taking shelter under his presence, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And let's respond to that by singing praises to God together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Amen. Our relationship has been restored with the Father, and we give him praise. And our relationship with the Father being restored, we also have our relationships with one another restored. And just as Jesus has given us his peace, now we can freely share that peace with each other. So let's take a minute uh, and greet one another with the peace of Christ. Remember, whatever people are comfortable with, maybe it's the elbow bump with the peace of Christ, or the fist bump with the peace of Christ, or the chest bump with the peace of Christ. Whatever you're comfortable with, let's greet each other in the name of the Lord. All right, all right, if everybody could get back in our seats, we'll continue, let's continue with our worship. Uh, first, uh, somebody just handed me these keys. So if anybody lost a set of keys, it says, uh, it says backup garage, it looks like. Blue keychain, does anybody recognize these? Anybody? 
Anybody? Okay, well, Herb, I'll give them back to Herb. Herb will have these keys up uh, wherever Herb is if anybody, if anybody needs them. All right, are you? Okay, there you go. So we, uh, we, uh, one of the, one of the, again, one of the great joys we have as a church is we have a relationship with a seminary, and we're involved in the training of men for ministry. We have an intern program, uh, and most of the time, you don't really see the interns a lot because we make them, like, slave away in the galleys below deck for a couple of years doing all sorts of menial tasks, <laughs> all, this, all this stuff that, uh, that has, um, like, all work, no glory, <laughs> Uh, and so all of our interns go through that process, and then in their final year of seminary, they, we get to do more things, and one of those things is they get to preach to the congregation. So uh, Aaron, why don't you come on up. Aaron Chismar has been with us uh, for kiddos. Oh, that's right. I'm so bad. Okay, two things, two things. We have all of our most a bunch of our gear is downstairs in the dining room where we've been storing it as we've met in the courtyard. Yes, uh, and because we're not meeting in the courtyard anymore, and First Pres now needs that space, we need to move all of our stuff back up to the chapel, and that's we're going to store it in the chapel while we're doing church in here. So what we need uh, is everybody who's willing to help to stick around after service and help us. Just uh, make a chain of, of moving our stuff from downstairs to upstairs. And more people that help us, the easier it'll be. So if you're able to stick around, please do that. Um, also, now is the time for our Kingdom Kids ministry. If you have kids between 5 and 8, you'd like to send them uh, to our Kingdom Kids ministry, meet right up here uh, on stage left. With uh, Nisa, we'll take our kids over to the patio for our Kingdom Kids, and we'll bring them back right before, uh, right before the Lord's Supper. Uh, and as always, if you have kids and you want to keep them with you, please feel free to do that. We love it when families worship together. Okay, Aaron. Aaron's been with us for a long time. Uh, f- since when? 20 what? 2017. 2017. He's been with us for three years. This is his last year in seminary. Uh, he's been behind the scenes uh, doing Kingdom Kids lessons, uh, doing work on our AV stuff, just doing all kind of stuff for us. And today we have the, the joy of of hearing him bring the word to us. So I'm excited. Come on up, Aaron. Let's give Aaron a warm res pres welcome. Thank you. You're up, brother. Oh, I am thrilled to be here this morning. Um, res pres has meant so much to me during my time in seminary. I tell everyone that it ke- it's kept me sane, which is no small feat. Um, Brian, Charlie, and Rob can probably tell you what kind of task that is. So thank you for encouraging me, and I'm thrilled to be able to bring the word to you. So today our reading comes from Psalm 121. Uh, So Psalm 121, please stand for the reading of God's word. I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in, from this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come here and reflect on your word to us. The gospel that tells us that you are by our side protecting us through everything we face in, the, in this life from the biggest, most dangerous trials we face to the everyday challenges that we struggle with every single day. So Lord, open our hearts to receive your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So there was a man who was walking along a windy, hilly road, and This kind of road, these kind of hills are similar to the hills that are all around us. 
There are lots of boulders, very rocky, uh, rocks all strewn about on the hillside. And if you've been hiking to Potato Chip Rock or Palomar or any of the other hills in the area, you would notice that there are lots of places off the trail hidden from view that you could go explore if you'd like. Well, in one of these hidden places, a gang of robbers lay waiting for an innocent passerby. And this man walked, unknowingly walked closer and closer to this gang of robbers until he got close enough. And they rushed out, they knocked him out, beat him up, took everything he had, and left him for dead in the heat of the sun. This story may sound familiar to you because Jesus tells it in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in that parable, Jesus assumes that his audience knows that travel was very dangerous. And our text here in Psalm 121 assumes those same fears. This song is a psalm of ascent. It was sung as people traveled to Jerusalem for the great feasts. They were worried about what might happen to them along their journey. And even now, traveling isn't completely safe. Freak accidents happen all the time that cost people their lives. But this psalm gets at a greater reality, namely that our entire lives are one of a journey or pilgrimage. So I think it's fitting that we look at this text now as we start to move away from the highs of Easter Sunday, right? We're back into the normal grind of our everyday lives. And, our, and on our journey through this life, we face all kinds of dangers. The physical world is unsafe. Our lives could be taken from us at any given moment. Our income could be taken from us. We could lose our jobs. But we don't just face physical dangers. We face spiritual dangers as well. We face constant temptations. And this is wearisome, isn't it? I don't know about you, but when I think about the constant evil that we read about in this world and my constant inability to defeat the temptations in my life, how I constantly lose battles that it seems like I should win, I get worn down. I feel hopeless. I may start to doubt. And what our text shows us today is that things don't have to be that way. We don't have to go on this journey alone. We don't have to feel unsafe and constantly worn down by physical and spiritual dangers. Rather, we can look to God for our help because he will protect us. And it does this by answering three questions. Who can protect us? What do we need protection from? And why does God protect us? So who can protect us? What do we need protection from? And why does God protect us? So let's start with the first. Who can protect us? Look with me at verse 1. I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come? We can notice here that the psalmist assumes that we need protection, right? The psalmist looks to the hills and he's overwhelmed with anxiety, which I'm sure is a feeling that none of you have experienced before. No, yeah. And, and not just this psalm, right? Protection is a major theme of both this psalm and the Bible. Like, the Bible assumes that we need protection. And the Bible actually assumed that human beings were going to be protectors. They were going to drive out evil. Remember Adam, God put Adam in the Garden of Eden to work and to keep it. It's the same word as in this psalm. Adam was supposed to protect the Garden of Eden. He was supposed to drive out evil as soon as he saw it. 
And he didn't do that. Evil walks right through the front door of the Garden of Eden, and the, the serpent successfully tempts Eve. Both Eve and Adam fall, and sin has a grip on the whole world. After Cain murdered his brother Abel, God asked him where his brother was, and he responded, Am I my brother's keeper? And then throughout the rest of the Old Testament, we see Israel's repeated failure to keep God's law. And I don't think we're very different from Israel. Israel's no different from us. We don't keep God's law. We don't drive out the sin and evil among us adequately. We don't care for our brothers and our sisters well enough. And so we have a choice before us. We can either try to keep at it alone, we can try to face the sin and the dangers and the evil that results from our sin alone, or we can turn to God. We can turn, we can recognize that we need help, that we need someone who will truly protect us. And that's exactly what the psalmist does. He recognizes his need for protection, and he just lifts his eyes up a little bit, right? He looks to the hills, and then he looks, lifts his eyes up to God. He knows that his true help can only come from God. So look with me at verse 2. The psalmist says, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And here the psalmist tells us that our help comes from who God is is. Our help comes from the Lord, from Yahweh. This is God's personal covenantal name. It's his first name, if you will. My first name's Aaron. God's first name is Yahweh. And in school, you're supposed to address your teachers with terms of respect, right? Like Mr. and Mrs., and then eventually doctor and professor. So imagine, if you would, the teacher or professor that you respect more than anyone else, who's way smarter than anyone else you know, comes up to you and says, hey, you don't need to call me doctor. You can call me my first name. Whatever that is, you can call me Bob. Right. Wouldn't that change how you thought of that professor in that class? Right, like you may have been intimidated before. Like, oh my goodness, how could I possibly pass this class? This guy's so smart. He wants so much from me. But they said, in essence, I'm your friend. We'll get through this together. You know me. I got you. Don't worry about it. And that's exactly how God is with us. He says, I'm your friend. Here's my first name. Call me. Here's my phone number. Call me with any of your problems. And furthermore, look at the second half of verse 2. Our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So it's good to have someone who likes you, right? It's good to have a friend, you know, Bob the, Bob the professor. It's great to have him. But it's kind of pointless if that person is powerless to help you. But God says, but our psalmist knows, God created the whole world. He created heaven and earth. So if God created the entire universe, surely he's strong enough to help you. Surely he can help you with whatever you're going through. So our protection comes from God, from who God is, because he lets us know him personally and because he is powerful enough to help us but the psalmist doesn't just give us this abstract, theoretical knowledge that God will help us. He shows us the quality of God's protection over us. Look with me at verse 4. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. You see, the pagans back in the psalmist day basically pictured idols as, or their gods, sorry, as stronger more powerful versions of people. The gods got angry. They drank. They got drunk. They uh, had kids. 
And of course, they slept. In 1 Kings 18, Elijah has a duel between himself and the 450 prophets of Baal. And basically the challenge is, who can get their God to respond first? The 450 prophets of Baal or the one prophet of Yahweh, of God? And Elijah even lets them go first. It's like, hey, I'm so confident that you're not, that you stink, that you can't do it, that you can go first and I'll lose if you get any sign whatsoever. And so for hours and hours, Baal's prophets cry out to him for help, for a sign, for anything. And for hours and hours, Baal does nothing. They all try, they try all sorts of crazy stuff to get his attention. He doesn't notice. It didn't occur to them that quite possibly he didn't notice because he didn't exist, but we'll, uh, we'll let that lie. <laughs> Elijah was greatly amused by their misfortune, and he taunted them by saying that Baal must be on vacation or going to the bathroom or sleeping. You see, the pagan gods are not always there or all-knowing. The pagan gods do slumber and sleep. In fact, they always slumber and sleep because they're not there. They're completely false hopes. And it's the same for our false gods. We're no different than the people that lived long ago. We just create different kinds of gods. If we put our trust in our own abilities, our job, our money, our kids, our social standing, the comfort that we have, all of those things can and will be taken away from us. All those things will let us down, either in this life or when we die. But you see, God never slumbers nor sleeps. He never goes on vacation. He's always watching over us. And Jesus tells us that not even a sparrow dies apart from God's knowledge. We should look to God for our help and protection because no matter how we feel, no matter where we are or what we've done, God is still there watching over, protecting, and keeping us. So we've seen our need for protection, that God wants to and is powerful enough to help us, and that his protection is constant. But that leads us to a second question. What do we need protection from? Look with me at verse 3. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. So the first category of dangers the psalmist shows us are sudden dangers. The phrase, he will not let your foot be moved, refers to someone tripping or falling, or stumbling, rolling their ankle. And remember that this psalm is a song of ascent. It's a traveling psalm. So think about how dangerous a twisted ankle, a broken bone, a fall would be to someone during the psalmist's time. Right, think, there was no ambulances to come pick you up if you fell or broke something. There were no cars for friends to drive to help you. If you're lucky, you may have had a donkey, but even then, wounds were easily infected. And if you were lucky enough to survive, if you broke something, you'd probably be a beggar for the rest of your life because you wouldn't be able to walk or do your job anymore. So here the psalmist is picturing the sudden dangers that we face in this life. You know, I just, um, I was just struck uh, yesterday, I think it was, I saw one of the people I knew from high school and college. She was pregnant, and throughout her entire pregnancy, um, she, everything seemed ex just fine, right? She had a normal pregnancy, she, was, she started labor exactly when she was supposed to. But then she just posted on Facebook that 
she, she had the child, and the child died six hours later. We don't know why. Or I was just, I wanted to go grab Liam, who was sleeping at the time, and give him a hug. Like, these sorts of things happen to us all the time, right? Our livelihood, our lives, they can easily be taken away from us in the blink of an eye. We think that we got it all made, that we got it all figured out, and yet these things happen to us, and we're left grasping for straws. But the psalmist says that God will protect us through all of these things that can attack us, that can harm us. And sudden dangers are not the only kind of dangers the psalmist faces. He also shows us the severity of the constant dangers he faces. So look at verses 5 and 6. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. I know from first-hand experience what it's like to be struck by the sun. You can just look at me and see why. When I started dating my wife, she couldn't believe that people were as white as my family is. So, But here we are. <laughs> if I go out in the sun without sunscreen, it is not a pretty sight. I will be all pink and red. All sorts of horrible things will happen to me. And while a sunburn is bad, the psalmist has much more to fear than just a bad sunburn. Look at the imagery the psalmist uses. He says, the sun strikes you. The sun strikes you down. It knocks you down. It wounds you. It destroys you. Severe sunburns and dehydration would easily kill the unprepared traveler. And similarly, the moon or traveling at night posed great dangers. The Judean desert gets freezing cold at night, just as it gets searing hot during the day. And without shelter, one could easily succumb to hypothermia. So in contrast to tripping or falling, the heat of the sun and the cold of the night are constant dangers. Can't get around them. They're always there. And by living in a fallen world, there are constant unrelenting patterns and systems of evil that we need sheltered from. There are constant patterns and systems of evil that we need sheltered from. While death can come suddenly, it's also a constant unrelenting force. Just things decay. Everyone is subject to one day dying. Everything breaks down. And injustice gets baked into the fabric of every society that has ever existed. I tried to think about that claim. I'm pretty sure it's right. I don't think there's a single human society that has ever gotten away without injustice infecting it in some way. So we see both the sudden and the constant dangers that attack us in this physical world. But the psalmist doesn't stop with the evils of the fallen world by and large. He looks at the spiritual dangers that we face as well. Look with me at verse 7. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. So here the psalmist begins to transition from the physical dangers that we face to the spiritual dangers dangers that attack us as well. The word for evil here refers to moral evil or sinfulness the vast majority of the time that it's used. And furthermore, the word for life could just as easily be read as soul. So we could look at this verse and we could say, the Lord will keep you from all sinfulness. He will guard your soul. And this is amplified by the images that the psalmist 
has just, that we've just looked at. Stumbling is used throughout the Bible to refer to people falling away from the faith. The sun and the moon were two of the most worshipped gods by pagans, and Israel often fell captive to sun and moon worship. You see, evil spiritual forces attack us as we travel through this life. Idolatry is a looming, constant threat. And through all of these dangers, both physical and spiritual, God promises to protect us. He gives us shade from the heat of the sun. He gives us shelter from the cold of the night. He gives us water when we're thirsty. He gives us a shade on our right hand. You think about Paul in Corinthians. He says that when you face temptation, God will provide a way out, a shade for you. Picture temptation as the heat of the sun beating down on you, wanting you to fall in, wanting you to cave in. And God says, I got a way out for you. I got shade over your right hand. I will protect you. I will shelter you. It won't overtake you. And there's still one more question this text answers. We've seen that only God can protect us because of his power and constant care. We've seen that he protects us from every danger that we can imagine. But the question remains, why? Why does God protect us? And that's what we see in verse 8. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Why? Why will God keep our way, our, our going out and our coming in from this time forth and forevermore? Well, there's two possible answers to this question. The first is Israel's answer. When the Israelites heard or sung or prayed these words, there's no doubt that their minds would be drawn back to Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 28.6 we read, Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. You see, this is where Moses is preparing Israel to enter the promised land. And he says, look, if you do what what God says, if you do the law, you will be blessed. And we read the the curses for our reading of the law this morning. If you don't do what God says, you'll be cursed. Cursed shall you be when you go in. Cursed shall you be when you go out. So if the Israelites obey God's law, they can stay in the promised land. And God will bless them. Similarly, if you want to uh, complete an Ironman... All you have to do is swim two and a half miles, then go bike for 110 miles, and then go run a marathon and do it all under 17 hours, and you, and you will have completed an Ironman. If I left something out, most of us, I wanted to say most of us because maybe Brian would prove me wrong, <laughs> most of us, if not all of us, can't do that. And when it comes to God's law, we definitely can't do it. We can't keep God's law perfectly. We have no chance. So we need a different answer. We need someone who can do this for us. And this is exactly the answer we're given in Jesus. In Acts one twenty one, Luke uses this same idiomatic language to describe Jesus. Listen, he says, The Lord went in and out among us. The Lord, Jesus, went in and out among us. Jesus became fully human. He did everything that human beings do. For 30 years, for the vast majority of his life, he worked as a manual laborer, a blue-collar worker, a construction worker, for most of his life. And through all of that, and then through his ministry... He did exactly what Israel couldn't do. Israel couldn't, utterly failed to keep God's law. Jesus fulfilled God's law for his entire life. And while God promised blessing on Israel if they kept his law, 
God poured out his wrath on Jesus, the only person who ever deserved God's blessing. God did not spare Jesus from the heat of the sun or the cold of the night. God didn't provide shade over Jesus' right hand. God didn't keep Jesus from slipping and falling. God removed his protection from Jesus as he suffered in our place. And while our sin and judgment was given to Jesus, his righteousness, his obedience, is given to all of those who believe in him to protect them. Instead of the failure that so commonly marks us, when the Father looks at us, he sees the righteousness of his Son, and so he can rightly and justly protect us because Jesus has earned his protection for us. And, God, and Jesus protects us so that we can enjoy him forever. God has always wanted to enjoy his people forever. That's why he created them. He wanted to hang out with Adam and Eve for eternity. He wanted to be by their side as they uh, journeyed through the, cre the amazing creation he'd made for them. And this protection starts now. If you believe in Jesus to protect you, that language of when you go in and when you out refers to the mundane activities of life, to one's daily work. You see, God protects us when we're in the car driving to work. God protects us when we're sitting at our desk, when we're doing our job. God even protects us when we're changing our kids' diapers. Sometimes I need to remember that. The Lord is always there. Because as we've seen before, the Lord neither slumbers nor sleeps. But pay attention to verse 8 once more. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. You see, God's protection is not just present, it's future. And the most important protection that God can offer us is not simply giving us what we want in this life, of making our lives comfortable, of doing what we want. It's true that God delights in giving his children good gifts. But the most important protection that God can give us is eternal life with him. The most important protection God can give us is eternal life with him. Through his perfect obedience, through his sinful life, or, wow, through his perfect life. Sorry, fire didn't come down. It's good. <laughs> through his sacrificial death, through his resurrection, and ascension into glory, Jesus earned heaven for us, and he freely offers it to us. God's blessing is not conditioned upon our obedience in any way. All you have to do is believe in him. This is our sense of rest. This is our sense of hope. God is protecting us now, but how much more Will he be protecting us in the future, in the new heavens and the new earth? Whereas Rob read, there will be no more dangers. There will be no more heat beating upon us. There will be no more freezing cold that overwhelms us. God will wipe every tear from our eyes. God will keep us safe forever. So these are the options before us this morning. We can choose to rely on ourselves, on our own strength, our own morality, our own comfort, our own connections, whatever satisfies us. Or we can turn to God for our protection. Sometimes the trials, the dangers of this life can be too much. They can overwhelm us. They can leave us defeated. They strike us down and leave us for dead. But for those of you who believe in Jesus, that's not the end of the story. Jesus, the true good Samaritan, comes. He comes to bandage your wounds. He comes to heal you. 
He comes to carry you to safety. He comes to give you shelter from the heat and the cold. He comes to protect you from all evil. So we don't have to be alone when this world overtakes us. We can lift our eyes from the world around us to Jesus, our Savior, our true sense of help. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this reminder this morning that your protection for us is constant and we constantly need it. If it were up to us, we would fall away as soon as we could. And yet you carry us to safety. You keep us from falling. You shelter us. You care so much for us. And so, Lord, help us to trust rely and believe in you for our protection and help. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand for the song of meditation. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. But whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Please be seated. If you get familiar with the Old Testament and you start reading it, you start seeing that it's really less a book about famous people in the history of salvation uh, that are like heroes and models for us to emulate. And it's really more a story about how Israel and God's people uh, just got into train wreck after train wreck. Israel running after other gods. Israel complaining about uh, everything that God had given them. Israel just over and over again breaking their part of the covenant that God had set before them. And God coming in and reestablishing them over and over and over again. And uh, the beautiful part of that is that that never stopped. When we come to this meal, It's God reassuring us. It's reminding us, no matter what happened this week, we come to this meal and we look backwards to the cross and to the life of Christ. And God says, I've got you. You are under my protection. I am sheltering you. And as you participate in this meal, know that you belong to my family and that will never change.
And so that also gives us a view forward where we look forward to the wedding banquet, uh, the great feast in heaven that we look forward to. At the end of time when we die, however that works out, we look forward to the great joy that we will experience in the future being part of God's family. And so this is this meal is about both of those things, looking back to why or how God saved us, looking forward to the promises that he has, and sitting and resting in the promise that he will keep us and protect us until that day. So this is a meal for, uh, for Christians. What that means is it's a meal for Christians. If you're visiting with us today, you're from another church uh, where the gospel is preached, you've been baptized, Come and take the meal with us. We welcome you uh, to the table. This is Jesus' table. If you're struggling this week, uh, if you are struggling under the, under the weight of temptation, you're struggling under the weight of your sin, don't sit this out. If you're in the fight, repent and come and take this meal and receive the strength that God gives us. If you're visiting here today and you're not a Christian, we ask that you sit this out. Uh, please don't take this meal. There are warnings in scripture against taking this meal in unbelief and we wish to protect you from those whether you believe that or not and not only that but taking this meal you are making a public profession that you believe that Jesus is the savior of the world and if you don't believe that uh, we would like we want to respect your integrity and we ask that you would respect ours as well and so instead take this time and pray uh, and if you want to know who God is more than you want to tell him who he should be he will answer that prayer so let's pray Father, you are a God of comfort. You're the God of our protection. You are the God who shelters us, Lord. Lord, your wrath and your law would be like the burning sun in the middle of the desert, as, Do as David says in Psalm 32. And we are in our sin outside of the protection of Jesus. You would be like the burning heat of the sun, sapping vital life out of us, Lord. But now that we are in Christ and in his protection, Lord, that son is now the source of our life and that you are pleased with us and that you are shouting songs of salvation and deliverance over us. We pray that you would comfort us here and now through this meal. Set apart these elements of bread and wine so that we might receive by faith the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Amen. On the night that Jesus was, was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's all, everybody come up, please uh, take some, some bread and some wine, go back to your seats, and then we'll all take together. We have, there's grape juice in the outer rings if you have health concerns. Would you now come and taste and see that the Lord is good.
brothers and sisters, the bread which we break is our participation in the body of Christ. Take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus was broken for us for the complete forgiveness of our sins. This is the body of Christ. And the cup of blessing which we bless is our participation in the blood of Christ. Take, drink, remember, and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus was shed for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, for the complete forgiveness of our sins. This is the blood of Christ. Now let's pray together. Oh, merciful God and Father, Lord, we thank you for your protection over us. We thank you for the salvation that you have given us in Jesus. We thank you that you are watching over us every minute of every day and every night. That we never have to worry that you have forgotten about us or that you're not watching us and protecting us. And so we ask, Lord, we thank you for that. We ask now that through the operation of your Holy Spirit and the remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ and the proclamation of his death, Lord, we pray that you would now strengthen and establish us in true faith and in fellowship with Jesus, in whose name we now pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let's stand for our last song of rejoicing.
Amen. Remember, if anybody can help us uh, stay out there and move gear from downstairs to upstairs, we'd really appreciate it. And also, kids, if you did the uh, Kingdom Kids uh, thing today, come up right up front right after the service and get your treat. And now as we all go out into the world to be light, know that God's blessing is upon us. We leave here today with God's word assuring us that he loves us uh, and that we are safe with him. So let's now lift up our, our hands, lift up your heads if you like, and let's receive together the blessing of our Lord. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen.